Um, we're now going to move on to another part of the world and hear about energizing the mine of the future and some renewables investments in South Africa and Western Australia. It's my pleasure to introduce Toscani Tombeni. Toscani is the group head of energy and carbon at Goldfields and I'm so pleased we uh, convinced him to come to Toronto in December and leave <laughs> Johannesburg's uh, lovely summer weather. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. It wasn't easy where I'm coming from. It's uh, 38 degrees Celsius right now. So stepping out of the airport, you know, I had to make sure I'm ready for this. All right, so thank you for inviting us again. Um, we have been here in uh, 2016, and we gave some quick updates on our journey. And this is truly a journey, and today we'll give you some further updates uh, on where we are and what we think is coming um, in front of us. Just before I go further, that's a, a photo not from the internet, but from one of our mines, a Gruyere, a JV that we have out in Western Australia. We have about six of these systems um, around our pit that we're developing. It's a mine that just started. We started mining a few weeks ago, and the first gold pour should be next year. Um, so the point here is it's not a big utility scale. It's a fairly small system, but it serves the purpose. It bridges the psychological barrier. For when we have to entertain the big systems, engineers will be comfortable, they will have seen it working, and they will understand some of the basic issues they have to deal with. Um, this is a very uh, impressive uh, installation. Um, we'll come back to it a little bit later on. Um, you can read all that, you'll, you'll get the slides. Um, this is gold fields. This is who we are. We produce roughly just over two million ounces of gold per annum. So by definition, we are a mid-tier um, small company that we, we believe we're punching above our weight when it comes to how aggressive we've been in some of these energy programs for us. Um, as you can see, we are in four regions in three continents. Uh, in Ghana, we have two operating mines. We have a JV as well. Um, and in the Americas, we have a, a mine operating in Peru, Cerro Corona, and I'll come back to some of these names later on. And in South Africa, we have a South Deep mine. And in Australia, we have three operating mines as well as a, a JV project. For us, the Americas consume about 10% of our total energy budget, uh, the highest being uh, Ghana with 46%. Uh, Those are large open pit mines, a lot of tracking, um, high volume um, types. South Deep is 18% of our total energy. That's an underground mine, coal phase, mining phase. It's at about two and a half um, uh, thousand meters. And in Australia, we, they account for 26% of total energy. That's a mix of uh, underground and open cast mines. Um, and in total, essentially last year, our energy spend was um, equivalent to $115 per ounce. That's about 13% of all in sustainable costs or 17% of OPEX. So by any margin, it's quite a sizable chunk, probably second to, to the HR or the salary bill to the company. So it does require a strategic focus for us. And being a mid-tier company, it's truly about survival. We do not set the price of gold and we are an energy price taker. So all we have to do being squeezed from both sides is to reduce costs. So essentially what we see um, as um, the trends around the energy security generally for, for the mining industry is it's not business as usual. I think there was another speaker that mentioned how um, things are changing very fast. So essentially, um, what got us to where we are today, it's not enough to take us into the future. Our business is being disrupted in multiple ways, in ways that we can no longer ignore it. Even if you chose to bury your head in the sand, um, you'll be forced to, to optimize. One, there's um, uh, no doubt that the artificial intelligence, the internet of things, and the connectivity, and how 
all of that is converging and coming to mining. It's opening up new ways to look at energy systems, indeed the mining uh, business as well. We see new business models of, um, of mining and new methods that we are fast adopting. And um, increasingly, especially after the Paris Agreement, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, emerging regulations that are driving us to have to attend uh, or accelerate our, our uh, effort in managing the environmental and societal expectations. Um, and this is uh, probably one of the key trends that we're seeing, and you'll have heard it from the opening presentation this morning all the way through to the panel uh, that we had, that um, uh, as a mining sector, we operate in communities and we have to be sensitive to the host communities and how we, we do our business. Um, specifically, um, in uh, for miners, energy security, according to the World Bank, they define it as a, a combination of availability, reliability, and affordability. And what we're seeing increasingly is you need to add low carbon to that, or some will say sustainability, which essentially those four pillars will complete your picture of being energy secure. So I say to our teams across the regions that none of our regions is energy secure because we face one or two uh, threats across uh, those four dimensions. In South Africa, for example, as we speak now, we're going back to where we were almost 10 years ago with uh, what we call load shedding, where the national power utility will switch off certain parts of the country in order to avoid the total collapse of the system. And, and, and here we thought 10 years, um, we've sorted things out. Um, same situation for us in, in Ghana, uh, where we are seeing a lot of um, uh, drive by the government to promote uh, renewables. There actually is an, a renewable energy policy, which calls for 20% for Ghana as a country to have 20% renewables by 2020. And guess what? The mining sector is expected to pick up the load. Uh, about 10% we are expected to have of renewables by 2020. Uh, and so are the other power generators. So essentially, it's uh, tough for miners um, in terms of us trying to balance the equation to get our energy security correct. Uh, I've already given you stats of how critical this is for us. Um, not to mention the volatility of the oil price. Um, we do, uh, we spend a lot of money on diesel for, for material uh, handling. So the volatility in the oil price um, becomes an issue for us. And, and now and then we do take short-term oil price hedges, but we would like to build in technologies uh, that will help us move away from uh, diesel. I'll show you a little bit more in that. Um, the other critical part with mining is, uh, uh, so you hit both sides. The energy prices are going up, but so is your energy demand. We are going deeper, we are going longer. The, geo, the, the old body, are not, it's not getting any softer, it's getting more harder, and these are becoming more remote. So combine all of that, you really have to find solutions and, and, uh, and, and have them implemented. What we've seen, though, for us is um, we've benefited significantly from what we call a transition from um, uh, diesel largely to gas, and we're seeing gas as a transitional fuel that we are able to use that and to accelerate our transition towards, uh, towards renewables. And I'll show you some case studies um, of where we've actually done that. Essentially, what we see as the industry responses and what the Goldfields has been doing is um, uh, three large or three clear sort of trends as responses are coming out. One, we see more partnerships um, across industries where there's a common agenda, um, uh, companies, mining companies and uh, coming together as well as one-on-one uh, -on -one partnerships, whether it's for specific tech development or a specific challenge that we're chasing. But uh, we're also seeing a lot of trends towards um, enabling our minds uh, digitally. Um, uh, and we've um, started to pilot on a number of systems ourselves to understand what that means. These are important responses because they then affect what type of energy you need and uh, how much of that energy you need. So you cannot just do 
energy or electrification aside from the mine design and what, how you interact with the mine. And that's probably one of the critical aspects that Kim mentioned earlier in terms of the mine design and, and that the iterative nature with, the, with energy solutions. Um, the ICMM recently, in October, they launched a uh, partnership with the OEM. It's called the Innovation for Cleaner, Safer Vehicles, in which there are three very clear goals, one of which is to reduce uh, DPMs, uh, diesel particulates matters, in underground mines, by uh, a, to go towards DPM zero mines um, by 2025. So that basically means uh, if it doesn't catch on quickly, it means diesel is getting out of our minds. The second part is uh, on, uh, on, on uh, vehicle interaction, that's on safety. Uh, we would like to remove people from harm. And the third one is a focus on, on open cast and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The solutions for open cast and underground DPM reductions are more likely going to be, to be similar. But that's a very strong message from industry in partnership with OEMs, and we need each other because OEMs need volumes, and volumes are as a result of commitment from mining companies collectively to say we are going down this uh, trajectory. Um, that's how we, we solve these uh, global challenges. And I'm glad to say that my uh, CEO, together with the Gold Corp CEO, they lead that uh, OEM ICMM initiative at the CEO advisory level. So we, we have, um, though we are mid-tier, we think we're punching above our weight in trying to contribute to solving some of these uh, challenges. I wish uh, the BNF team had actually spoken to this. They did, a, I think, a, a very good report. If you haven't seen it, it's on their, on their website. That basically shows you how the captive uh, PPAs have been growing over the years. And I bet if you told someone we'll be where we are today in 2008, they probably will not uh, believe you. But uh, this is how far we've come. Uh, what's interesting here for me is you have the retail and the telecoms uh, sector that have led in terms of the size of the projects. They've led this journey. Uh, mining companies, we're very risk averse. We tend to be fast followers, though. And when you open up that report, you'll find two materials companies that um, um, I, I think they've done something wonderful to um, uh, three digit megawatt PPAs, captive PPAs. Um, but the issue here for us is uh, it's coming to us as a mining company. Um, and. Um, you will reflect back on the Bloomberg presentation. The two key things that remain, and I think it's been touched on a little bit earlier. Um, the first one was definitely touched on, which is the life of mine uncertainties and how IPPs sometimes do not understand that. Um, we have mines that uh, 15 years now, when we bought them, we had three years of life remaining. We're still there 15 years later. And guess what? We still have three years remaining. So. Technology is technology. You have to think uh, business innovation. And the presentation from Agnico here is challenging you as well to think differently. But I think the second critical part, it's um, depending on where you're operating, the electricity industry market, whether it's regulated or deregulated, that can throw a curveball. Uh, in our 2016 update here, we did a highlight on how we see regulations uh, potentially accelerating or slowing us, slowing us down in adopting renewables. And uh, that's a very critical aspect in uh, especially developing countries where they depend on your base load um, uh, uh, draw from usually the state owned um, or structures that they've invested in to supply power. And so even the World Bank actually frowns upon captive PPAs. I wish they were here so we can have a conversation on that particular one. But these are all the dynamics that we have to balance in all of this. So what have we done? What have we been doing? Um, since 2011, we've been implementing an integrated energy and carbon management strategy. And some of the key highlights of what has come out of that is, uh, one, we are a very active ICMM member. That's the International Council of Metals and Mi for Metals and Mining. And we've been recognized by a number of uh, investor ESG ratings. Um, your Robisco SEM, DJSIs, 
Um, and we've been doing our carbon disclosures for the last 11 years, and we've uh, consistently been A plus, A minus, and we supported the Paris Pledge for Action in 2015, and recently we have shown our public support for the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Essentially, we've graduated our CDP disclosures to TCFD, and these are all very important milestones in our journey. Uh, and what we then did is we said, so for the next four years, from 2017 to 2020, where do we want to be? One, we said energy security is an issue for us. And remember, energy security, it's got four pillars. We said we want to get that out of our top 10 uh, group uh, risks. So let's focus on strengthening that. The second part is we said we need to improve our energy costs. Um, that is a very dynamic uh, uh, challenge. And the third part is we want to be reducing our carbon footprint. And linked with that is uh, we've done a risk assessments um, looking at some of the climate-related material risks around our sites and the host communities and being able to find solutions that will help us to, while we're reducing carbon footprint on our site, that we can actually do something with the host communities. And that's work that we're beginning to go deeper into now. And more interestingly for us, we've also said we want to integrate energy management into business. So in other words, my uh, down from the CFO to the GM, they should be able to talk how they are optimizing energy. And what we said is, um, let's see how close we can come to ISO 50001, which is the Global Energy Management Standard System. Uh, and I'm glad to report that uh, one of our mines made this year got certified for that standard. It's the first mine in our portfolio. It's the first mine in the country. And in that particular country, government and our peers came to us. They are still coming to us. They take us through the path. How did you do it? I'll show you which mine it is. So essentially for us, we're looking at it not only from electrification and PPAs and renewables. It's a system which is integrated to help us manage um, our investor expectations as well as uh, stakeholder expectations best we can. So what I'll do, I have a few points just to take you through the journey. The line here was uh, when we uh, last came here, it was uh, December 2016, Energy and Mines. And at that point, we spoke to you about our rooftop, very small system in our corporate office. I'm glad to say it's still working, it's functioning. And um, we do once in a while run solar 100% for the building and no one even notices when there's a fault outside. Um, only when the generator, diesel generator finally kicks in, when the batteries are depleted because everyone is in the office, that they realize that, ah, we did not have uh, external grids uh, supplying us. Um, and we spoke about the, the 40 megawatt uh, project that we, we had uh, completed a feasibility study for, for our South Deep Mine. And we spoke to you about uh, the diesel power plant that we had just converted at the Granny Smith Mine in Australia to gas. And uh, at that point, we probably mentioned we were busy commissioning or we were about to receive gas turbines in Ghana. Uh, those that operate in West Africa, in Ghana in particular, will understand the, uh, the issues that we had with uh, security over there. And I'm glad to report that in December that year, we actually commissioned um, that many more gas turbines in Ghana. Um, and what we have been able to use that momentum for was to look into our Agnew mine in Australia. We started to look at a, a, a pre-fees. Uh, we moved on to look at Granny Smith. Granny Smith was already now on gas but we wanted more because we can see we're growing deeper. There's more ventilation. Everything is just, um, we need more power. And we um, started as well updating our understanding of Salaris Norte. It's a very, very wonderful project in Chile that we have in the Atacama Desert. And our goal is to see if we can get at least 20% of renewable power into that asset. It's not grid connected, it's, it's remote. And Tying up a grid is not an option. The terrain is not forgiving. It will be very, very expensive. So it's quite a challenge for us. 
Ghana, we again beefed up a, um, with the installation of an additional gas turbine over there. So at that point, I can tell you that uh, all our Australian mines are on gas-generated electricity. And I can also tell you that 95% of our Ghana electricity comes from our on-site gas turbines with the IPP. Now, that's a significant shift from where we were a few years ago. And I can also tell you that at Salares, at the Cerro Corona in Peru, where the terrain is not flat, it's very uneven, it's mountainous. Um, we are in a basin. The only flat area we have, it's a dam. That's a body of water. If you are an IPP, you're already thinking floating PV, maybe yes, that's what we thought too. <laughs> so we are looking at it. The first pass didn't look commercially viable, but we have an interest to do what? One, to reduce um, um, evaporation because uh, we have a water balance equation for the asset. And two, we have to be looking at, instead of putting floating balls to reduce um, and, and whatever else that other people throw on the dam, we're thinking maybe PV panels might work. So I am still looking for a solution there. Um, I will be taking your business cards at the end, not now, please. But uh, that's another challenge, which if you are an IPP, you can actually, you can dig in and see if you can find something that can work. Um, and, and we continue. We went back to Agnew, and it looked very, very promising. Um, the ink is about to dry, so I won't really tell you the details of that particular one, but all I can say is it's going to claim a lot of fests for this, fests for that. Okay? Not only for us, we believe for the region in, in Western Australia, potentially for Australia as well. So it's, it's, it's a massive uh, project, uh, and we still have the 40 megawatts project at South Deep, and there we, we've had to, this is one of the areas that's uh, regulated, and the regulations having been clear to give us direction on how to proceed, what pace and when can you do what. And so we remain uh, firmly committed to that project. We are waiting now on the final consultations on the public regulations to see what's been provisioned for. The good news is uh, provision has been made for captive power. For Initially they were proposing 200 megawatts per annum nationally. There seems to be support in Parliament to lift that up to 500 megawatts uh, at the national level. So in other words, the IPPs that are already in South Africa have a very good chance now to start engaging miners and other people for captive PPAs. Uh, in, uh, at Granny Smith, as I said, um, the study looks very, very positive. We think we'll start construction uh, next year. So I won't be able to give you names of our partners as yet. Some of them might be in the room. Um, uh, but uh, also to let you know, the JV that I mentioned with Gruyere, we had to uh, dig up about 200 kilometers of a pipeline to get natural gas there for a 48 megawatt uh, gas power plant. Conventionally, you will have gone diesel because you're already cutting diesel to site anyway for your mining activities. But we've taken a different view and we've embraced the transition from um, from the hydrocarbons slowly through into, into renewables. Uh, so that's a bit of a journey that we've walked. And by the way, in Ghana, we are assessing renewables as well. So if you understand Ghana and you'll know the limitations and the possibilities in the region, that's in West Africa. So for next year, there's a number of things uh, coming. We will be starting construction on those two projects, uh, potentially three potentially four projects, uh, but we will, uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll do a fly again with the energy and mines as we always do. But uh, so what have we done? You know, I've taken you through the four regions, I've taken you through each of the projects and some of the challenges and the exciting developing stuff. But the exciting part for us is that that's how much uh, we've commissioned, uh, 134 megawatts of gas turbines um, in, the last few, in the last few years with that much more in study. And that's how much more we have uh, under study for solar. Uh, and also wind as well. The first for us, we've never had a mine, Goldfields mine powered with wind. Um, and we have uh, five megawatts of, of battery as well, um, supporting some of those uh, projects that I mentioned here. And the impact overall, we're looking at um, more than 200,000 um, tons CO2 abated or taken off the grid. 
So that's uh, the kind of impact uh, that we are designing our systems and building them into our strategies uh, that we're trying to hit. Now, the second part is uh, in the last few years, we have now have a global, we have a group energy and technology strategy. And I just want to show you quickly what that means for us as far as the energy lens, not just PPAs. Uh, we structure this in Horizons. Horizon 1, that's where you basically look at things that we should be doing already. Uh, if you want to build a business case, just go find the variables and define it and get it going. No debates. Uh, and that's stuff that we should be good at. We can pivot from one mine or one region to the next. We've done it. We have the experience. Um, Horizon 2, we begin to look for things. The technology is matured, but maybe isn't fully commercially ready yet, or we've seen someone else do it, but we haven't done it. Uh, and we, we, have, we see other ways of uh, integration or increased integration and connectivity. That's where we're going. And Horizon 3, we're starting to look for things that might not yet be in full commercial or technology readiness levels yet. And so this gives us a feel for how we are tackling not just energy supply side, but the demand side as well. Because for us, as a price taker, we are looking to manage our costs in, in all fronts. So what do we see coming into the mind of the future? Um, we think that uh, we are going to have, I think it's already been mentioned, that there's going to be more electrification. We're getting diesel out. Uh, it's going to be a journey, it won't happen tomorrow, but there's a lot of pressure. The diesel particulates uh, uh, um, removal is coming in from regulations, and so we have to respond. You have no option there. And we see gas as a very key transitional uh, fuel for us, and that allows us to bring more diversification into our energy mix. And um, we also see a lot of our power plants uh, being connected um, where we are able to to have good communication with our large loads in our minds and we we connecting up a lot of our um, large loads underground with ventilation on demand so essentially I, we can talk to the fan the fan can talk to a machine coming the machine can track a person so take advantage of all of that data and actually use it to to, to optimize your systems. And I will see more modular systems that are going to be connected all over. The last one, which is about storage. Um, I know we, we understand the chemistry of the, the chemistries of the various battery solutions. I think one to watch in the next few years will be hydrogen storage. Um, I think there's one or two, there were one or two comments that have already come up in this morning, but I think that is the one where we seriously have to look at. We cannot cut back on renewable. Uh, we cannot cut back on wind uh, when there's too much. We have to store it somewhere, and same for solar. I think that's going to open up new opportunities for us. There was a comment here on this is electrification. What about material handling? With gas, once you have the infrastructure onto your site, you can begin to do... Um, you can begin to burn less diesel in your trucks as well. You can uh, have gas canisters, natural gas canisters, that you can use to either do trolley assist on the ramps, or, but there's a whole lot of other things that having gas on site allows you to do. So the roadmap might be battery electric vehicles, but there are many steps to walk along the roadmap. And we believe that uh, energizing our, our trucks with uh, gas, natural gas, is probably one of the things that uh, will become critical. I think what's happening, we're seeing now, is this disruption, the way it's coming, and how fast the OEMs are developing the technologies that uh, is disrupting not only how we operate the mines, but it goes back to the drawing board. How do you design the mine? And more importantly, how are you going to close the mine? Are you still going to close it, or are you going to repurpose the mine for other things, most likely energy systems? So the disruption for us is not electrification. It's across the drawing board for a mine. And um, that's essentially what we see uh, coming at us. And that's a picture from our Gruyere 48 uh, megawatt uh, power plant. If you can find the gentleman to, the, to your left, I'll uh, probably make you coffee today. He is in the room. So thank you for, for the time, uh, Adrian. And